Could you please stand, folks? Please be seated.
God is with us in this place. God's spirit comforts us. God's presence supports us, and God's love gives us strength. For a human life is sacred. It is sacred in its being born. It is sacred in its living. It is sacred in its dying. A human life is sacred. Friends, my name is Reverend Dave Moores, and uh, on behalf of myself and our student minister, Lauren Kirkey, and the whole congregation here at Shaughnessy Heights United Church, I welcome you to this place, into this time of remembrance and celebration. Uh, on behalf of the family as well, I'd like to thank you. Your presence here honors them and honors Dennis's memory. We're glad that you're here and that we, we hope that you feel welcome. You know, I was going up and down the uh, aisles a number of times uh, getting ready for today and uh, kept having to dodge a construction zone uh, fencing uh, on the walls there. You can see some of it, the plastic. And I, why is this hanging in my way? And then I remembered uh, what's going on with the walls. Some of you may never have been in a church before, so I hope you feel relaxed and welcomed. But I just wanted to mention that uh, Shaughnessy Heights United Church is a church that is striving to be open and welcoming to all. And uh, for the last few weeks during Lent, we've been talking about the barriers that the Christian church has put up uh, that has kept some people away from us and in community with us. And so the barriers are marked there by the uh, construction fencing, so to speak. But as you can see, it comes up the wall, it falls apart as we get closer to God's love. That's the pretty little hearts there. And then as we get closer to the communion table and whatnot, God's love bursts forth and we're getting ready for Easter that way. But we're trying to knock those barriers down so we hope that you do feel welcome and you're welcome to come back anytime. The family uh, wanted me to thank, and I, I'm very thankful that uh, Greg Kwan is here with the McGee uh, Chamber, uh, Chamber Choir and the McGee String Orchestra, and Lisa Lan is here with the Lord Bing Chamber Choir, and we are thankful for their uh, presence here. Uh, it's quite extraordinary, I think, to get a bunch of high school students out on a Saturday to a memorial service. Uh, so thank you for being here, uh, young ones. You are most welcome, and thank you to the directors for uh, marshalling them and bringing them here, and to Peter Stiggins for uh, organizing all that for us. And the family wanted to mention that all of the music picked today was specifically curated by the family and uh, by Dennis's wishes as well, some of it. And uh, they wanted to know, you know, no, I didn't pick the music because it would have been all Van Morrison and Bruce Coburn. Um, oh, maybe some Gustav Holst, of course, for good measure, but... Uh, they picked it, and it's music that's meaningful to them and to Dennis, and uh, we're thankful for all the musicians who are here uh, helping us out today. Could you take a moment and uh, just make sure your phone is off or on silent? <clears throat> it's the 21st century. This is the stuff we talk about in church. Please turn off your phones. Put them on silent. If, if you're the one person who has it ring, uh, your phone will be confiscated because the minister always needs a new phone. So... There you go. There's your warning. And if you could please join us immediately following the service, you could just go this way, or you can go in, out to the narthex and outside and up, up the street a little bit. There's a hall. Uh, the original church building is now a hall, and uh, you can weave your way through and find your way to a time of uh, fellowship and refreshment that's so important on a day like today. It's when we get to share some memories with each other around table and food. It's a time of great community and Dennis would be greatly joyed to see us all here gathering, chatting, laughing, crying all at the same time. So please take some time to come uh, have some food and some, uh, some drink afterwards and some storytelling. We are gathered here this afternoon by death, the end of a good person's life, the life of Dennis Frank Tupman. Though we will mourn, for mourn we must. Let this also be a time of remembering the person he was. Let this be a time of affirming the kind of life which he lived. Let this then be not so much a time for brooding upon his death, but a time for celebrating a human life, the life that was Dennis's. By our presence here this afternoon, we pay tribute to the memory of one who was an important part of our lives, who was dear to us, to show our love and respect for the man he was. And we've come together to show our support for Dennis's family, to share openly and honestly God's love for them. 
This service is about saying thank you. It is about saying I love you. And it is about saying goodbye. Let us pray. God of grace and tender mercies, be with us and bless us as we gather here. The curtain of death has fallen between us and the one we love. Give us the strength and wisdom we need to face and to endure our enormous loss, and eventually to rise above our grief and find ample thanksgiving for Dennis's life. God who gives us life and receives us when our life is over, keep us and comfort us now. Your goodness is our strength. Your purpose is our hope. May our confidence in your goodness and our faith in your purpose be unwavering. And may our words be true to your glory, and to your creation this day and always. Amen. Can I have the McQuee and the McGee choir come and join us, please?
I don't know if anybody told the musicians, uh, but the plan was, uh, we're going to feed you supper, we're going to have a sleepover, and you're going to be here for tomorrow morning. <laughs> That's the plan. You know, youth group rules are pizza. If you have pizza, kids will stay. So we're going to have big, lots of pizza tonight, and tomorrow morning you're going to sing for worship, and that will make me very happy. Call your parents. Not right now, but call your parents. Anyway, thank you, uh, McGee Chamber Choir. That was lovely. As I mentioned a minute ago, it's important to stay uh, and tell stories on a day like today when we're saying goodbye to someone we loved. Stories have the power to bind us, to give us unity on this uh, little blue-green planet of ours. They have the power to guide us in times of trial, and stories have the power to heal us and to bring us to celebration when we are hurting. To that end, today we have some uh, people who want to lift up some stories and some words of remembrance of Dennis's life, and we're going to start with his uh, colleague and friend, Peter Stiggins. Peter. Good afternoon. Tupman family, friends, and colleagues of Dennis Tupman. I would like to thank, I would like to start by thanking Rachel, Allison, Brad, and Denise for inviting me to share some of my memories and reflections of Den's professional life. I was very fortunate to meet Den back six decades ago in 1962 in the fall, when he was assigned as a grad assistant for an instrumental ped course that I was taking at UBC. Dan had taken a sabbatical from his teaching position in Kitimat. The days that Dennis took over the class were indeed very, very special. Dan, as a seasoned educator, fresh out of the trenches, gave us the straight goods, as only Dennis can do. We really sat up and took notes when Dan told us that we should consider taking a teaching position in a remote school district where we would be treated like a god. <laughs> Unquote, Dennis. That statement shocked us greenhorns to the core, considering ourselves as educators and emphasizing the importance of teaching the whole child. After a year at UBC, Dennis returned to Kitimat, where he continued to build a music program that became the talk of the province. Now I would like to ju jump to the year 1967, Canada's centennial year. In preparation for this centennial, the federal government, believe it or not, was offering grants to every city in Canada to plan a major centennial event that would not, not only do the city proud, but also Canada as a whole. Dan, being an ambitious 30-year-old educator, convinced his active parent music group that Kitimat should consider sending the Mount Elizabeth school band to Expo 67 in Montreal to perform as their centennial project. Imagine Dan going to the council meeting and presenting his projects as follows. Your Honor, Mayor and Council, my name is Dennis Tupman, and on behalf of the Mount Elizabeth School Band, I would like to propose a Kitimat Centennial Project focused on a very special group of young people. This group of talented individuals want to share their love of music with fellow Canadians. I urge you to financially support and underwrite the cost of our trip. Oh, by the way, we also need new uniforms. Incidentally, the other proposal on the table was a new park for Kitimat. You can probably guess which project won the bid. Yes, Dennis and his troops were off to Montreal in their sparkling silver and blue uniforms. The band truly put Kitimat, the town of tomorrow, on the map. Yes, this is the Dan that never would take no for an answer. Dan was an eloquent orator, 
convincing others of the power of music, as well as emphasizing that music creates community and builds relationships. In 1971, the Tupmans moved to the big city after 13 years in Kitimat. Den was appointed the district principal and coordinator of fine arts for the Vancouver School Board. Now he was not only responsible for music, but also drama, dance, and art. The school board didn't know what hit them. <laughs> the Vancouver Den didn't hesitate to use his persuasive powers to outline the importance and relevancy of the arts to a comprehensive education. Den highlighted the importance of working collectively and treating all the art disciplines equally. In no time, Den was organizing workshops as well as many professional meetings, not just at the district level, but also at the provincial and the national level. As one of his colleagues said to me, as a quote, Den was always upbeat and sincere. If there were things that needed to be done, he did it, even if the project had not been approved by the big bosses and bean counters. End of quote. Dennis always said it is easier to beg for forgiveness rather than to ask for permission. And Den was always reminding us that help is on the way. <laughs> Den thrived on being around people and he consistently encouraged educators to stand up for the arts. In time, he became the president of the BC Music Educators. And then after that, the president of the Canadian Music edu Educators, to name just two of the many com extra commitments that he took on. His positive voice was heard in every corner of Canada. All our lives are richer for having rubbed shoulders with this giant of a man who gave so much to others. He never wanted the focus to be on him. He wanted the focus to be on our craft and our students. I can still hear Den saying that the arts are the lifeblood of a vibrant society. Then the question I pose to all of you is, how will we continue to support the arts? Den was a voracious reader, an avid listener of quality music, and when he wrote about the arts, he would suggest books and recordings for our perusal. In his retirement years, Den continued to be actively involved in adjudicating many festivals, along with speaking, writing, and encouraging all the folks in the trenches to continue to strive to do their level best. To conclude my remarks, I would like to talk about Den's legacy. His legacy, in my opinion, is all the folks he touched over the years all the students and teachers he has worked with in various settings. All the, he truly has been an inspirer, an ambassador for the arts, a soul worker, mentor, and friend. His legacy continues today in that we have 72 students and their teachers performing to honor Dennis. These young performers from Lord Bing Secondary School and McGee Secondary are the beneficiaries of Dennis's legacy. Any time that Dennis attended a performance, invariably you would hear at the end of their selection a big voice booming out from the back of the room. So in the spirit and enthusiasm of Dennis, I say, bravo students and teachers. God bless Dennis. Thank you so much, Peter, and uh, Dennis's granddaughter, Andrea, has some words for us. Today, we're all sitting in this room because of one person, one singular person who single-handedly impacted all of our lives for the better. Some of you are here because that man entered your life and simply never left. It may have been 40 years ago or it may have only been five years ago. It may have been through music, church, or community. Whatever it was, we all got to be blessed by the presence of the one and only Dennis Frank Tupman. But there are a few of us who knew him as someone else. We know him as Poppy. To me, my brother and sister, Matt and Megan, and our cousins, Haley, Alex, and Kenny, 
He was simply the funniest man who engaged us in ways no one else could. We didn't know about all of his huge successes in life and his long list of accolades. We just knew that when we showed up at Green Lake, or he and Nana arrived in Kitimat and Terrace, that laughter, love, dance, and most importantly, goofiness was about to start. His major accomplishments didn't matter to us. The big energy of Poppy mattered more. I think I was probably about 12 or 13 years old and so incredibly shy that I wouldn't even answer the phone when it rang at home. So naturally, my conversation skills were lacking. One day, Poppy asked me how I was doing and I answered with my standard, fine, response. This was not going to pass the Poppy requirements for an acceptable answer. He sat there and reminded me of all the options in the dictionary that could be used that would evoke a similar response, but be less bland. <laughs> to this day, at almost 40 years old, any time I find the words, I'm fine, slip out of my mouth, I can hear Poppy's voice in my head, gently reminding me that I can do better than that for a response. That was the kind of man Poppy was to us. He accepted us. He accepted all of us for each of our own individual personalities and traits. He learned each one, so he would always be able to talk to us about whatever it was that moved us in life. He would sit and listen, he would ask the questions, he cared. There was never any judgment. It was open arms acceptance, no matter what. And if at any time there's an opportunity for bettering ourselves, he found a way to guide us in a very gentle way. This carried on all the way into our adult lives. As we grew older, instead of running around and playing doctors and nurses while he laid in a hammock and we had to surgically remove his eyes, we started morning coffees, sitting on the living room couch with the Green Lake sunshine streaming in, and we would delve into these conversations where Poppy would almost be on the edge of his seat with fascination and intrigue. He challenged us to think about things outside of what we thought we already knew. We would all finish our coffee and then go outside where we would help with yard work, knowing full well that within half an hour, we'd be standing outside the shop, leaning against the Batmobile, discussing something else in depth. It goes without saying that music has touched all of our lives because of Poppy and Nana. In elementary school, when it came time to pick what instrument we wanted to play in band, once my parents told me that no, they would not pay for a huge tuba or trombone, I knew there was only one instrument for me to go for, the clarinet. Obviously the clarinet, just like my poppy. I was never instrumentally blessed like other members of my family. Playing the clarinet did not come naturally to me. Reading music was a challenge, but every time poppy would come to visit, he'd bring his clarinet and sit with me and give me tips and guide me. He then gifted me with a metal mouthpiece cover that was his as a teenager, and I still have it. The gift of that mouthpiece cover was a steady reminder to keep going, keep trying my best. When playing an instrument never became my strength, nor did singing beautifully, my passion for music turns toward music appreciation. From Poppy, we learned the skill of picking up on different sounds, beats, and instruments in any song that we listen to. My sister and I laugh a lot about how we can not only sing along to a song, but we can sing all the guitar riffs and drum all the air beats, or air drum all the beats too. But apparently you can overdo that. Not long ago, Poppy requested that Megan and I sing Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles. <clears throat> which, of course, we did, only to be interrupted partway through by Poppy telling us that we didn't need to do the do-do-do-do part because he could already hear that in his head. In more recent Green Lake years, I remember waking up on Poppy's birthday and going upstairs. I said happy birthday and gave him a hug, but that wasn't good enough for him. Some of you won't be remotely surprised, but that man had me sit on the couch and provide a solo performance of happy birthday. Shortly after that, my former husband came downstairs and Poppy had the most tone-deaf man I know sing to him as well. After we both finished our solos, we got critiqued. The music adjudicator in him came out. My performance, while beautiful, was a little pitchy at times. Let's be honest, it was probably a lot pitchy. My ex-husband's questionable performance was met with some great reviews, with encouragement on how no one is actually tone-deaf and that with the right amount of practice, he could one day have a beautiful singing voice. Poppy always had the kindest and most helpful advice when it came to anything music related. I think the biggest piece of advice I've ever received from Poppy was this. Always make sure you find a partner in life that has the right toolbox. No, he wasn't referring to anything inappropriate, and he wasn't actually referring to an actual box full of tools. He was talking about finding that person to bring into your life who carries in their toolbox all the qualities that make a great partner. Over the years, this advice morphed into various versions for me. It started to involve friendships, work relationships, and romantic relationships. 
a lot of people come into our lives every single day and not everyone is going to carry the right tools to remain in our life. We may have the tools in our own toolbox that keep our lives fulfilled, but it's important to find those relationships with people who have the tools that can work with yours or that you don't have yourself. Maybe you have a hammer, but you're missing the nails. Find the person who has the nails and is looking for the hammer. What I'm saying here is that for Poppy, everyone here in this room and those who couldn't make it, you all had the toolbox that had what he needed in his life, and he then shared his tools with all of you. And your toolbox is meshed into one in order to make his 86 years of Earthside life as fulfilling as possible. Poppy always knew what kind of tool he was looking for, and we're all so lucky that we were able to share ours with him. I'm going to wrap this up with a song, a line from a song that is so fittingly perfect for Poppy. How have I not made an ode to every word you ever said? Poppy may have passed on to eternal rest and be with Nana, but I know all of us will continue to create our own odes inspired by him, and will smile every time we use them. We love you and miss you, Poppy, Batman, our hero. Now invite uh, Den's son-in-law, Brad, to come and share some words with us. If there was anyone that helped us see the world differently, it was Dennis. Musician, philosopher, philanthropist, man of faith, and humanitarian. Dad, BBD, Poppy, and general silly guy. Dennis devoted his life to music, continuous learning, leading, coaching, and teaching. He was a very serious guy that never took himself too seriously and he moves seamlessly from deep philosophical discussion into silliness and back again. His sense of humor, the sublime joke always just lurked below the surface. His interest in and care for others, whether he knew them or was about to know them, was written on his face. When he engaged in conversation with you, the rest of the room disappeared and there was only him and you. Absolutely devoted husband to Ruth and her memory, and loving father to his daughters, Rachel, Allison, and Denise, if we are feeling deep loss in Dennis's passing, theirs is profound. We had Dennis in our lives for years, and they had a lifetime. He loved his daughters unreservedly and accepted with open arms the partners they brought into their lives. And open arms is literal. Hugging was going to happen. You better be ready. Dennis was always there for his girls, whether it was with thoughtful advice, emotional support, or to lend his labor to help with renovations and gardens. Or when he showed up at, unexpectedly at Ray's place of work to play a lusty, full-throated happy birthday to her on his saxophone. He was their safe place. Of course, with household teen of a teenage daughters in the late 70s, it wasn't going to be all sweetness and light. And where thoughtful advice and emotional support wasn't going to work, Dennis was willing to make the lessons more tangible. Dividing the shower stall with a black marker to ensure everyone understood who was responsible for cleaning which area. Or ensuring that the daughter that had thrown her shoe through the front door window paid for half of the cost and that the one that had ducked paid for the other half. 
or when the spare room wasn't kept clean enough by gathering the offending materials and burning them in the backyard, including, inadvertently, his own croquet set. Dennis and Ruth, Ruth had a wonderful voice. Dennis and Ruth met in Victoria on the set of Rose of the Danube, and music permeated theirs and their children's and their children's lives ever since. From their earliest days in Kitimat, where Dennis and Ruth were a creative force in the burgeoning arts community, and Dennis was building a band program from the ground up, through the Vancouver years when Dennis's career flourished, to the retirement years at Green Lake and Hundred Mile House, music was always at the heart of everything. Piano lessons, recitals, choirs, community arts productions, these were the daily bread in the Tupman household in Kitimat. In Vancouver, Dennis would come home late in the evening with people like Alex McLeod or Jack Glatzer and listen to Bach Toccato in and Fugue in D minor or any given opera late at night at full volume, much to the consternation of his daughters. As the grandchildren got older and of course started playing clarinet, flute, saxophone, percussion and so on, Nana and Poppy visits to the north at Christmas always entailed a family band concert after Christmas dinner that Poppy directed. Poppy always made sure that they all were involved, even to the very youngest, with at least a bell. With Green Lake became the summertime nexus for the family, there was a pretty good chance that there would be an impromptu concert on the deck. And for the musicians and non-musicians, of which there were very few, me being one of them though, there were music appreciation sessions in the evenings where each person would present a particular piece of work or song and explain why it was important or impactful for them. All genres were thoughtfully considered. Dennis's and as well as Ruth's commitment to performing arts, music and community leadership was unabated in their retirement at Green Lake and Hunter Mile House. But of course, music was at the core. Having to set aside his beloved clarinet due to physical limitations, the sax became Dennis's go-to instrument and the Hunter Mile community band his outlet for his love of playing music. I'll not forget hearing his amazing solo performance at the seasonal concert as he stood and with his music elevated the room. It was truly wonderful. It's little, little known though, the reason that Dennis stood for this particular solo is that his bandmate, Doc Nicholson, sitting beside him, had indicated to Dennis that Dennis's chair was sitting on the band director's oxygen supply line. <laughs> oh. Oh. And the director was starting to look quite gray <laughs> and maybe about to expire, which launched Dennis to his feet which I took as just an, an emotional response to the music, launched to his feet and saved the, the director from a, 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 ba a bad outcome. True story. Curiosity drove Dennis's commitment to lifelong learning, and he truly was a lifelong learner. I, I had the pleasure of going through his, the books that had made many, many uh, di distillations over the years after he passed and looking at the, the titles of the books and the, different, and the different topics he was interested in was just amazing, amazing guy. Dennis's curiosity was a, uh, brought, a, brought a lot of questions along with it and uh, I don't know how many times a dinner guest would sit with a full plate of food in front of them and, and sit and answer questions from Dennis as Dennis tucked into his own meal. <laughs> it would take Ruth's intervention to stem the flow of questions and allow the guests to finally enjoy their dinner. Andrea mentioned Poppy's early morning discussions. I had the same experience as everybody else and I come to the top of the stairs on an early summer morning at Green Lake and he, would, uh, he and Ruth would both be sitting there already and Dennis would have a little list of topics already written on a piece of paper that he wanted to cover over coffee. And it was mostly questions about what we thought about this or what we thought about that. 
He was always questioning and wondering what other people were thinking. When out on his driveway for a walk in the neighborhood, he would engage with whoever happened along, and it would almost always be more than just the usual salutations. And the people would stay and stay and continue the conversation. And if you stood close enough, you'd understand that they were being closely questioned about this or that topic. He was an amazing, uh, amazing conversationalist and people loved talking to him. Dennis was always a leader and a teacher. Whether it was within the context of his, of his music-related career or more broadly within the communities he lived in throughout his life. He relished testing the boundaries, asking those difficult questions or just seeing what ideas work. In grade eight, my grade eight, Dennis was my guidance teacher. Who knew? And I have the vivid memory of him spending an entire class teaching us self-hypnosis. This is a room full of 13-year-old boys. I mean, who does that? More seriously and controversially, in the early 1970s, he had the Kitimat United Church Choir singing ex-Beatle George Harrison's My Sweet Lord and Awaiting on You All. To top it off, he presented a public multimedia event of the then controversial Jesus Christ Superstar in the United Church Sanctuary. How is that for forcing us to see the world differently? And speaking of leadership, and, and uh, Pete has already referred to it, how is it that he convinced community leaders to forego building a park? They would had a nice plaque there with their names on it, and they decided that they would put their money behind that high school band on Dennis's word and send them across Canada on a train without cell phones, without telephone, and, and, put, their, and put the children in his hands. I think he estimated there were two or three additional adults along on the trip. And they barnstormed across Canada and whistle stops, they got off the, the train, they played their, their pieces on their way to Expo 67 and eventually played there as well. How did he get them on the program? Who knows? And how did the parents let him take them? Mr. Mr. Tupman back in those days definitely walked on water. Excuse me, Reverend. If, if Dennis, if Mr. Tupman said, then it was okay. And these kids went right across Canada and back again on a train. When Dennis, in theory, retired, he only seemed to get busier with his work in music education. Ever an advocate for local community involvement, he also quickly became engaged in local politics. He became president of the South Green Lake Ratepayers Association, bringing with him all his energy and intellect and Robert's rules of order to an unsuspecting South Caribou and the attendant bureaucrats. Living on the shores of Green Lake, he experienced an environmental awakening and through his leadership and with the support of his lieutenants, Marie and Bruce led the South Green Lake, Green Lake Ratepayers in advocacy for the protection of the, of, uh, and preservation of Green Lake, the surrounding lands and quality of life of the residents. The bureaucrats didn't see him coming, but they quickly learned to take Dennis and his team seriously. So pretty accomplished guy. And it just, uh, Pete just touched on, on all the things he did professionally and, and what brought many people into this room today. But he had this amazing, silly side to him. How is it that this same person could also be found in a Batman costume multiple times over the years, or dressed as a Christmas elf, or in full drag, competing for and winning the Miss Winter Carnival crown in Kitimat? or crashing the McGee talent night in full drag, lip-syncing Sarah Vaughan. Pete, you remember that? Or somehow dressed as Pierre Trudeau's butler. I don't know, there's a story there. Maybe somebody can tell it later on, but uh, he, that's what he did. Or for that matter, playing Scotland the Brave through the butt end of a ceramic duck. Or laying an egg on request. He did all these things. For all Dennis's serious intellectual power, musical talent, and charismatic leadership, bubbling away just below the surface was a very silly man. 
It often showed up during the most serious of discussions when he would sense a vein of pretentiousness creeping into the conversation and suddenly break into a Pythonesque mockery or into some weird version of German that wasn't really German at all. When Dennis received his honorary doctor, honorary doctor of Laws at the University of Victoria in 2011, he gave an engaging and emotional speech on the importance of musical education. That led to the logical conclusion that all in attendance, including all of the gathered dignitaries in their finest regalia, sing in round, row, row, row your boat, which of course every, everybody lustily did. Dennis filled the room and our lives with his warmth, genuine caring, and inexhaustible curiosity and eclectic interests. But for all that he was, most of all, he was a humble man trying to do the very best he could for others. As important as the arts, and music especially, were to Dennis, these were eclipsed by his commitment to his family and the care he provided Ruth, his life partner, during her decline. Dennis would write letters to his daughters on significant milestones in their lives. The principles that he lived by can best be described by what he wrote to Denise for her 18th birthday. Dennis wrote, There is much that I would like to say, but one thing I always hope for my children, that they would live a joyful life, would think well of themselves and others, would not judge severely the foibles of others, and would help those less fortunate with compassion and would walk life's path humbly with a firm belief in God and an awareness of our place in a wonderful universe. In the beginning and in the end, there was music. And in Dennis's words, my soul, I'll never get over music, never. Dennis, thank you for sharing your soul with us. Thank you, and invite our two young gentlemen here to come up and sing for us.
I'm going to read to you now from uh, the Apostle Paul's first letter to the people of Corinth, we call them the Corinthians. This is chapter 13, the famous, famous passage some of you will recognize. Paul writes this on love. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I might boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious, boastful, arrogant, or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end, and for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end, for we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Hear what the Spirit has to say to us this day. May we be blessed in our hearing and in our understanding. Amen. See if I can chase my Neil Diamond voice away here for a minute. <clears throat> I would have loved to have known Dennis Tupman. I just have to say that. I wasn't honored to know him, and I just think uh, we would have had a good couple rounds of questions, answers, and ponderings. I would have loved to have sat down with him and chewed philosophically about Paul's letter to the Corinthians, especially chapter 13. When I was a child, I thought like a child. Or Now we see in the mirror dimly, but then we will see clear. I, I mean, I can just hear him chewing on that and uh, tossing it around. With, and I, I just wish I had gotten that chance to do that. Maybe you can take a little homework home and tomorrow when you wake up, have your coffee. Just chew on Paul's words for a little bit or on Paul Simon's words. Either one, uh, both are as complicated at times and yet so beautifully clear. That's right, I equated St. Paul and, well, two St. Pauls, really, Simon and the Apostle. Anyway, I'll leave that to you. I noticed for the first time today that Paul, the writer, the Apostle, starts immediately with a critique of the percussion section. Did you catch it? Without love, my voice is a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Poor percussionists, poor percussionists. Not all of us are lucky enough to be in the blessed low brass section of a band. This passage is fundamentally about love. It's read at a lot of weddings. It's not about that kind of love. The eros, that's the Greek word, eros. It's the kind of love we don't talk a lot about in church. It's not that kind of love. Paul's writing about agape, which is... Uh, translated from the Greek as love, but really means God's love, unconditional love. Or if we put it into human form, we might call it uh, selfless love or servanthood love. So this is the kind of love Paul's writing about. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not arrogant, boastful, irritable, or rude. It's servanthood. It's selfless it's unconditional. I, I like to call it the no matter what love. If you're not sure what that kind of love looks like, just think about Dennis for a minute and all the stories that we've just heard. Now, you know, he wasn't a saint. I'm not going to 
make him sound better than he was. But the fact is, everything I've learned so far about Dennis Tupman points to selfless servanthood for the greater good of the world and of his family and of his friends and of strangers and of students. I think agape is a good word to ponder when thinking about Dennis Tupman. As we heard, he was very accomplished. Even served here at the mighty Shaughnessy Heights United Church as choral director for a while, way back, before I can remember. He was quite accomplished, as, uh, as Peter said, a giant of a man in the eyes of many. And he often was embattled, he battled the uh, powers and principalities of the education system. No one mentioned it today, but it was mentioned, I think, in the obituary, Tuffman's tough tactics. He loved a challenge, and he was awarded for it, numerous awards, and yes, an honorary doctorate of laws from the University of Victoria. And yet, get this, this is the part I love. His favorite food was not escargot, and he didn't love hanging out at Michelin star restaurants. No, his favorite food was meatloaf and corn on the cob. Just let that settle in for a minute. Oh, Dr. Tubman, we're so glad you're here. You're much esteemed, and you're a battler of, you know, battler against the system, and you get people to do stuff they never thought they'd like to do. Even that smile, I'm just looking at the smile thinking, he's got something he wants me to do that I'm uncomfortable doing, but I'm going to do it anyway, because look at the smile. And you're greatly awarded, and you have the order of this, and you've got doctor, an honorary doctor, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but I like eating meatloaf and corn on the cob, and I like going to White Spot. White Spot. That right there is Dennis Tupman, if you ask me. I always ask a family what a favorite food was, but this one just is perfect. Because behind the moving and shaking, behind the uh, great accomplishments, behind the awards and the honorary doctorate was a guy who liked meatloaf. There's a groundedness about that. There's a settledness about that. There's a salt of the earth about that. There's something selfless in meatloaf, corn on the cob, and white spot. Sorry, I'm just having a little white spot moment. <laughs> my, my, my stomach was just talking to me about Nat's fully loaded beef dip. Anyway, man. You know what I love? Uh, I watched the, uh, the University of Victoria honor today again on the, on the YouTube. And uh, all of you should watch it, students especially. Listen to what uh, Dr. Tupman said about education and about life. But what I love is after the, I gotta say a fairly stuffy citation, uh, and everybody's there in their gowns and all dudded up. It's a very formal engagement. The first thing he did was greeted the assembled children. That's Dennis Tupman and that's Agape. Normally you would say, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Chancellor and President and Professors and, you know, you go down the list from the top to the bottom, so to speak. Dennis started with, greetings assembled children and then moved upward in an old-fashioned way, upward or downward. I love that he greeted children first. I kind of thought everybody should look around in that, in that crowd and wonder, are there actually little kids here? Because, you know, there's lots of hoods and gowns and funny-looking hats. And then, as you well know, famously, he unpacked row, row, row your boat as a metaphor for life. We got to row, but gently and merrily down the stream, and life is but a dream. And he unpacked all of that as a metaphor for life and art, arts education. It was glorious. And I actually just wanted to play it as the little message today, but here I am anyway. I also love this Kitimat band trip story. It's caught my imagination for the last couple months since I met with a family. Just because I can't imagine waking up in Kitimat one day in the 60s 
and saying, I got an idea for a band trip. Okay, now I grew up in Halifax, okay? And a band trip, you were lucky if you got to go to Yarmouth <laughs> or, or Glace Bay, Cape Breton. I mean, like four hours maybe in a car or a bus. That's about as far as you were allowed to go. I mean, you could dream of Charlottetown, but no, that's university. So that he woke up one day and thought, we should take a bunch of kids from Kitimat to Montreal. To Montreal by train. I, I just, uh, there's hardly anything that could follow that to say about Dennis Tubman because it is just so rich in a great Canadian experience for good Canadian kids learning about their nation, learning, going to meet the world at Expo, filled with a sense of wonder, barnstorming their way across. Who knows where they stopped? Horn Payne, maybe? Have you ever been to Horn Payne, Ontario? Train goes right through. Oh, some Horn Payne fans here. I see nodding. Maybe they stopped in Horn Plain or Chapelot or Sioux Lookout or who knows? I think anybody here on that trip? There they are. Let's get them, get them after a coffee. We'll get the stories. Unbelievable sense of agape, sense of servitude, sense of selflessness that drove to education and love. And of course, we shouldn't neglect his years of lay ministry at Hundred Mile House and his involvement in the church there and in the community. Just want to stop on all these things to say that sometimes the Bible can be complicated. Sometimes we get the words of Paul a little confused. But, but if you really want to unpack 1 Corinthians 13, listen to the stories you've heard today and lean into them for their simplicity, but also for the love that Dennis shared. And, and here's what we do on days like today. We don't just say goodbye. We say goodbye while learning from the one who's gone on before us. And so here's the most important thing about today. Not all the stories about Dennis. Not how much you loved him, that's important. But what you do with it. So today I'm going to encourage all of you to let that agape, that unconditional love, that, that divine love that's in all of us, like a spark, let that fall open a little bit more. Like, how many of us know our neighbors' names anymore? Right? I'd like you to learn your neighbors' names. Wave to them when they're getting in their car across the street. It freaks people in Vancouver out if you do that. Hey! Morning! Get to know the people around you. Talk at the bus stop. Not to yourself, that's weird. Talk to the people next to you at the bus stop. If, you, if you're in the neighborhood where there's like front porches and stoops, you know, so many of our neighborhoods, everybody hangs out in their back deck now. Hang out on your front stoop with like popsicles and soda and say hi to people. And if they stop, you just offer them a, you know, offer them a popsicle or soda or something. I mean, imagine. Or here's one of my favorite things to do. Talk to the person who's taking your money at the grocery store and use their name. It's right on their name tag. And there's some great names in Vancouver. There's some great names. Say hi. How's your day going? Are your feet tired? Are you almost done? Talk with love to each other. Or if you really want to get this agape thing down, phone a friend you haven't heard from in a while or a relative you had a bit of a break with. Fall open to selflessness in new ways. Just one small way tomorrow and then another way the next day. As we say goodbye to a dear friend and a colleague and a family, a dad, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, in your gratitude, just take a moment to give thanks, but to recommit to what we've been given to share because it's in us and it's greatly needed. With our thanks to Dennis. Amen. The Lord Bing Choir is going to come up and sing for us.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for all the blessings of life, for watching over us in death, and for all the ways in which we come to know your love. We thank you for those who share our lives, for families and loved ones, for caregivers and companions, for friends and neighbors. Especially today, we thank you for Dennis, friend and neighbor, teacher and mentor, servant of the church and of the world, devoted father, grandfather, great-grandfather, for the gift of his life and for all in him that was generous and kind. We feel now the pain of parting with our loved one, but we rejoice that many were privileged to experience life with him. We thank you for the friendship he gave, for the strength and the peace that he brought. We thank you for the love he offered and received. We pray that nothing good in this life of this man will be lost, but will be of benefit to all, that all that was important to him will be respected by those who follow, and that everything he valued will continue to mean much to us now that he has died. We ask that he may live on in the hearts and the minds of his family and friends, inspiring courage, informing conscience. This is our prayer, and we offer it in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
flows of angel hair and ice cream castles in the air and feather cannons everywhere looked at clouds that way but now they only block the sun they rain and they snow on everyone so many things I would have done but clouds got in my way Cloud illusions I recall I really don't know plans At all Moons and Jews And Ferris wheels the dizzy dancing way that you feel As every fairy tale comes through I've looked at love that way But now it's just another show And you leave them laughing when you go and if you can, don't let me know Don't give yourself away I've looked at love from both sides now From give and take And still somehow it's love's illusions that I I really don't know love. I really don't know love at all. Tears and fears and feeling proud to say I love you. Circus crowds I've looked at life that way Oh, but now, old friends They're acting strange And they shake their heads And they tell me that I've changed Well, something's lost But something's gained In living Every day I've looked at life From both sides now From win and lose And still somehow It's life's illusions I recall I really don't know life Sorry, Joni catches me off guard there. And uh, Wayne Shorter on sax, uh, he just died a few, few weeks ago, so 
a beautiful piece and a beautiful montage. We're going to sing, uh, invite you to sing Joyful, Joyful. Uh, and the choirs are assembled here to start us off. And the, is the, is the, are the strings going to play it? No, the strings say no. They were not, they were not paid for that. Okay. I'm just not sure how we're going to get into this. How are we starting this? Peter, do you know? <clears throat> okay, thank you. They're going to give us a short intro. If uh, somebody would like to offer the ministers a copy of their bulletins, we'd love to have the words. So anybody who can uh, hand us a bulletin. Thank you. Let's go. Savior, we commend your child, Dennis. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold and a lamb of your own flock and a son of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. And on our hearts and on our homes, the blessing of God, in our coming and our going, the peace of God, in our life and our believing, the love of God. And at our end and new beginnings, may the arms of God welcome each of us and bring us all home again. Amen. I invite you to stand, please. <clears throat> 